Okay, the second kind of evolutionary morphology we'll be talking about is theoretical morphology, which is where we compare the spectrum of conceivable forms to those that actually evolved. So first we're going to talk about the theoretical functional morphology of snails. Um, so here's my favorite New Yorker snail cartoon for your enjoyment. So snails are, are gastropods, they're within the phylum mollusca, <coughs> and they take lots of different forms. So here's just a figure from your uh, textbook showing some of the different morphologies that snails take. So the question is, why do snails take all of these different shapes? And the person that asked this question was a paleontologist named Dave Raup. Raup was a really influential um, paleontologist who was very quantitative. And he was one of the first paleontologists to really apply a lot of quantitative um, skills and tools to the fossil record, both in terms of diversity analyses, which we'll talk about um, in the next lecture, but also in terms of um, the geometry of different organisms. So this is his geometric analysis of shell coiling. So what he did is he basically made a model of how a shell coils. Um, and he came up with a number of different variables that described all the different ways in which you could make uh, a shell. Um, and I'll just go over those here. So the different variables are um, in the top right, distance from axis. So you can think of this as sort of like a loose coil or a tight coil. Um, on the left um, corner is expansion rate, which is how much the diameter of the shell changes as, um, as it curls. And then uh, down the middle is translation, which is um, whether or not the, um, the coiling of the shell um, goes up um, and down or just stays in one plane. So does it sort of become a high spired or does it just coil in, in one single plane? And so what he did was he then made a theoretical morphospace space using these three axes. Um, and hopefully you can see this. Um, I've also posted a PDF of the slides where you can um, look at them probably in higher resolution. So what you can see is we've got uh, our axes. So the axis on the bottom right is um, distance um, of generating curve. On the bottom is the translation. And then on the uh, other side is expansion rate. Um, and the shaded in areas are the only areas where we actually have uh, living or fossil specimens that represent those forms, um, pretty much, which is pretty cool. So um, we can see that we've got, um, you know, different snail forms. <clears throat> we've got limpets um, in like the, the right hand side. So limpets don't really have any coiling at all. So their um, distance from generating curve is really small. Um, we have different types of snails in that top uh, gray area depending on whether or not they, um, they coil within a plane or out of a plane, and depending on whether or not they're loosely coiled or tightly coiled. And then there's also some points that he's highlighted in here where we don't find organisms that make these shapes. Um, and so one example is on the left-hand side, you see that sort of like elf hat looking, <laughs> like uh, this one right here. Um, so this one, uh, falls into a point right here, and there are no uh, living or fossil snails that have this shape. So you can think about why that might be, right? Is it a, a structural thing? This doesn't look very robust. You look like you could sort of snap the tip right off of this thing, right? So it's perhaps evolutionarily not advantageous. Similarly, if we look over here at these really loosely coiled ones here, um, again, you can imagine that a very loosely coiled snail shell would be very easy for um, an, an animal like a crab to crush with its, its claws. And so the areas that we see filled in here and up here, which is sort of our more normal snail shapes, um, you know, there's a ton of, of theoretical morphospace space in this cube that's not filled. And so by thinking about what is filled and what's not filled, we can think about the structure and function of a snail shell uh, in a new way, which I think is, is pretty cool. Um, and here's just another diagram, I think this is from your textbook now, um, showing, again, basically the same thing, that actual species are not randomly distributed, um, and that there are constraints within, within the spectrum. Um, 
this is basically the same thing <coughs> showing again uh, world expansion rate um, and overlap so that like basically in the bi in the in the terms of a bivalve um, you can't have too much whirl here uh, because, of course, you need to have um, the two shells closing together. So he also thought about, about these issues as well. So we can think about what the morphology of an organism in the empty space and would look like and why the space is empty. And I sort of talked about that a little bit, but that's something that you can think about a little bit more yourself.